Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three very short, very small, but uh, simple, but really just beautiful, and I think very, very interesting systems. These are games, distinct games. The first one is Stealing the Soul, which is like a solo game. I don't really review solo games very much, but this is really interesting because it uses some beautiful, beautiful art, and uh, I just wanted to, to show you guys. So yeah, Stealing the Soul. I'm looking at Shadow and Fae, which is the second edition of the book, and this is just a beautiful book. It uses great public domain art, and it's really interesting. And then the last one will be Rogueland, which is an interesting, very simple kind of hack of Knave and, and, and the games like that. So you'll be able to see what I'm talking about here in a minute. All three are quite interesting. I'm going to go through Stealing the Soul first. Part of what drew me to this book, uh, I was on you know, DTRPG, and I just saw that they had a sale on it, and uh, I, I saw the cover, and I was like, that's so beautiful. And I clicked on it and looked through the preview, and I saw that it uses the art of John Bauer, and I love John Bauer. He's a fairy tale artist, um, all in the public domain, and this is by Kent David Kelly, and it's just beautiful. This book is just delightful to read through. It's only 25 pages, but it's a very interesting solo game. It has a ton of great, flavorful ideas. Highly recommend you guys check this out, so let's go through it. The idea here is that um, once, ago, uh, once in the ago, <laughs> in the kingdom of snow veiling near forest and there lived a wise shepherd the piper at the gates of night and this was you you sang and piped eerie music to freyr the god of truce weaving seeking to bring peace between king snorgardir of the humans above and king margloth of the trolls below there's this idea of the trolls and the humans and essentially um you are the spirit or soul of the of the shepherd prophet who's been turned into a spirit and trapped by the Troll King. And your uh, your niece, this princess, has to come and rescue you. And so you are sort of controlling your yourself, but you're not the character that's going through. You're kind of helping her. It's a really interesting idea for a game rather than you being the hero. Um, you're the spirit that the hero is trying to rescue. And so you're kind of guiding her or helping her or, or seeing her path through the story. And so it's just a really interesting way of going through. I think it's a fascinating little background, and it's a beautiful, beautiful book. And, the, and again, the, the, the events that you run into, the, 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 the lore here, I should say lore in one way, but it's just the fairy tale uh, flavor. The tone of this is perfect in that fairy tale vibe. I love that feeling, and I think you can see that throughout this book. How the game begins and how to play it, there are six ability scores. They get higher and you get, um, you know, You'll be able to do things if they get to a certain point. And then there are different abilities you can get. Um, you have a godmother, your princess has, uh, starts at 10 shares of resources, and therefore resource types. You have brew flasks, food satchels, gold nuggets, and spice seedlings. And you can choose how much you have. And those will defend, you know, change the things that you do. Then there's the, the map of the forest endless, regions unknown, where you start, and then you encounter things as you go. So, I mean, look at this art. It's just beautiful, beautiful. I love it so much. Uh, Kent David Kelly did a great job here, and John Bauer is just a fantastic artist. You guys have never seen his art before. Check it out. Um, so again, it's all in the public domain. So here are some of the encounters you can have in the realms of Forest Endless. Let's look at the Air Wife, Dancing Hunt of Mirketra of the Venomous Mist. This windswept meadow hides the ever-shifting and opalescent Mirketra, troll wife of air, who is truly sweet yet poisonous. Refer to the Dancing Hut's lore, page 18 for more. So if you run into that, that's one thing you can do. If you roll two and a five, you get the Fire Wife instead of the air wife. The dancing hut of Hjartoblotha. Hjartoblotha. Hjartoblotha of the burning blood. This ash-graced bonfire clearing is home to Spry Hjartoblotha, a troll wife of fire, who is clever yet unforgiving. Refer to the dancing hut's lore for more. Or you could roll 2-1, which is Crow, the crow's spirit haunt. This ruined tower hides the shadowy roost of Kraka, the hooded crow spirit. Kraka shares eld gifts with those who are in need. When you first encounter Kraka, Either gain one Eldritch Herb, page 18 of your choice, or plus two Cleverness. In later encounters, if your Cleverness is under five, Kraka offers to carry you to any already explored region if you wish to visit, and leaves you there. These ideas are just beautiful. The Kestrel, the Maiden, the Half-Elven Maiden's Grotto, Laurel-crowned Meralfi, Half-Elven, dwells here with her songbirds in a cave of trickling waters and whitest snow blooms. She will teach you carefully in how to cast glamoury glows and illusory fireflies upon the air. When you first encounter male fairy, Malfrey, Meralfi, <laughs> Meralfi, gain plus three charm, also accepting a minus one penalty to non-charm power of your choice, uh, one that is currently two or higher. In later encounters, if your charm is one, her deft charm, arcana increases your charm to two. 
But there's just these beautiful ideas and things that you're encountering. And for a solo game, it's just delightful. Because very often in solo games, I don't know, it, it just feels very mechanical in my mind. Like you have these all these mechanics and things going on, and then the story kind of comes after. This is definitely not that way. The solo, this is flavor and tone and story. First and foremost, you're drawn in by those things that you're running into, and the story kind of comes out of it. I love it. There's impling troops, <laughs> impish challenges. The outcome of an impish challenge. Bartering with the chastest one, cha chastest ones. Uh, the fierest forest veils wonder. But again, look at these beautiful pieces of art. I just love them. And it's one of those books that, you know, not, every pl not everybody plays solo games, and I totally get that. But if you want ideas, gather what you will. If you want ideas for your game, if you're playing a fairy tale game, a Dolmenwood kind of game, then this is a great book. Um, if you can get it on sale, especially, beautiful. Oh, control sorrows are perilous. I love that word, perilous. That's not a word that we use very much in the modern language. Um, but the perilous. Uh, it's, it's certainly a, a word that comes through in that fairy tale tradition. Fairies are perilous, good or bad, right? <laughs> Seely or unseely, they are perilous. Royal heist, the throwing of stone, hammers, valor versus valor. The fate of the princess and the shepherd. And then optional rules for making it a journaling game or not. And then you have that beautiful piece of art there at the end, stealing the soul. So I, I just, again, think you guys should check this out. Beautiful game. Uh, so, you know, just came out this year. Lovely. Lovely, lovely, love you. And I just think, again, John Bauer is so um, fantastic as an artist. And to use his art here and, uh, and the way that it's used, it's, it's, it fits right in with the game. There, there's no disconnect between the pieces of art and the, and the world that's being described, the, the, the encounters that are being described. Uh, and the tone of the, of the writing fits the art. You know, there are other games that have tried to use public domain art. There are other games that have tried to be fairy tale like other products and things. And there's a disconnect very often between the art chosen and the prose used. Like, if you're going to do that, you really have to find the right tone. And this book has. So, Stealing the Soul by Ken David Kelly. Highly recommend you guys check it out at least. I'll put links below to where you can get it. Uh, the next one is Shadow and Fae. <clears throat> this is a very interesting little game. It's only 40 pages, it's a very simple RPG. But it uses really, really beautiful art throughout. You have Gustave Doré, you have uh, Walter Crane, just great uh, artists, great artists throughout. Uh, this is by um, J. Christopher Earle, it looks like. Uh, so this is definitely influenced by Into the Odd. <laughs> definitely one of the acknowledgments here. One of the acknowledgments here. Uh, and then the Goblin Laws of Gaming. Um, so Shadow and Fae, it's a strange world out there, child. True, all is well and orderly behind the city walls, or so it usually seems. But out there beyond our gates, well, there's no telling what you might find. Shadow and Fae is a game for would-be explorers and heroes in a fantastic world of danger and mystery. Um, useful but not demanding and evocative, quick to pick up. That's what this is trying to be. Quick to pick up, useful but not demanding and evocative. And certainly the rules are like that. You have the standard dice that you're gonna need, and friends. <laughs> That's what you need, is friends. The essentials, you have might, grace, and will, and each ability begins at one. And you can increase other your scores uh, by decreasing another up by up, up to three times, and scores can be negative. And it's very simple. You roll a d20, you're trying to roll above a dc. Most tests are dc 10, some are 14, some are 18. Criticals are 20, fumbles are 1. You have disadvantage and advantage. You have a skill, you get advantage on that. And then there's saves and hope. Uh, referee may call for it, roll a d20 equal to or under your hope. Each character starts at five. It's like a special saving throw, basically, to avoid a consequence. Um, so this is absolutely fascinating. You can burn your hope to increase your dice, die rolls on a one-to-one -one cost. So you can make it harder for you in the long run by you know succeeding in the short term. So it's a very simple system. That's it. That's the whole basic system. And then you get some extra things like passions, which are... Uh, Basically, when you when you start to act on your passion, it's like a failure or a drawback. Uh, their daily desires, you gain hope. So if you play in character, but it may, maybe not in a way that's just like meta or in a way that's just helping the, helping you. Uh, it may, in fact, maybe it's a drawback. You gain this hope, so you can gain that currency. So it's sort of like you know D and D does something like this with advantage or inspiration. It's a little bit like that, but it's a, a more solid mechanic for that sort of thing. You have gear and fatigue, simple enough. Hit points and death and how that works. You get mortal blows, take some fatigue, and eventually you can die. 
Um, one of the last, one of the things I really think is interesting here is that when you die, you speak your last words. It's an interesting idea. Very simple rules for time, exploration, and combat. And again, just very simple. This is not a complex game. Tales and turning pages. Now, this is a really interesting aspect of the game. Essentially, your character levels up by gaining pages <laughs> or, or telling their tale. And so you're adding chapters and you're basically, yeah, you're, you're building a fairy tale in your character. It's really interesting, right? So in addition to the essentials of the previous table, each character chooses a tale which is their class, sort of, and then you gain a chapter from that tale, and then as you level up, you get more chapters. You get more chapters as you level up. And you get XP, um, uh, you know, from doing different things, completing quests, slaying monsters, or recovering gold. You get your tales. It's a d20 table. If you want to just roll randomly, you get commoners, soldiers, but there's a page for each of them, so I'll go through them, right? So you have commoner. This is a chapter. <laughs> each of the chapters, uh, the commoner just has nothing fancy. Failed career. This chapter doesn't count against the usual four-chapter limit, so you can start as a commoner and take other chapters as you go forward. You become something more. You start with a failed career, though, right? So you get a skill and some equipment. You have a vice and a virtue, and you have some basic extra abilities that go up or down. Very simple. The soldier, though, Right, he gets the combatant chapter, and then he gains two tactics on chapter one, two, uh, chapter one as well. And you can see the tactics that he gets there: passions, uh, the combatant, and what that means, and skills. You can choose poetry, tall tales, maps, or cooking. <laughs> really cool stuff. Very simple though, right? Again, all of these are very easy. The chapters for the Outlander are set: fire within, sharp senses, local spirits, foul oath, or combatant. Right? You can get. You get, you get, or uh, both, right? You can choose which one you want. Which chapter are you? The Outlander has a special, a special, their special tale. And the same thing with the Knight Errant, right? They have a set chapters that you can pick from, or maybe develop as you level up. That's really, really cool. And they have secret passions. <laughs> the Knight Vengeant, the Duelist, the Alchemist, the Bard, the Savant, the Thief. The merchant, the ranger, oops, the druid, the enchanter, the cleric, the wizard, the sorcerer, the dwarf, the changeling, and the returned. That just reminds me of uh, uh, the, what are they called? The Eternals from um, uh, Divinity Original Sin 2. Or, not, they're, they're not the Eternals, whatever. I forget what they're called, but the, uh, the skeleton people. That's so good. So, so good. Dry bones walking. For better or worse, you are an animate skeleton. <laughs> You have some adventuring gear, some lights, room and board and followers, how that works, weapons and armor and how those work, weapon and armor traits, and some creative combat rules here. Um, you can you know, use the laws of reality. Animal companions, holdings, and retainers, and the laws of magic, how magic works in this game. It's a dice sum, highest, lowest rolled, which I love, love, love. That's one of my favorite, that's like a Mouse Ritter. It's the same thing, um, dice sum uh, magic. Right, so you cast a spell and it does something based on the dice, the number of dice you used, and the, the sum of the, what you've rolled, and the highest and lowest on the different dice you've rolled. The different schools of magic. The school of the dead, school of ether, true seeing, veil, the fine fundamentals, divine spells. And you have spells by name and what they do individually. So cool, you don't have levels of spells. These are just a spell book you can get access to. Although if you go back here, it does look like um, there maybe is a an order ring? Maybe not, though. Deflection and magic missile? Yeah, maybe not. Uh, these are just listed by, by uh, alphabetically. How, you, how to craft new spells, how to determine the effects, determine the scaling and to set limitations. Advice for running the game? Very simple advice. And then a thanks for reading. I think this is excellent. And if you look at the uh, choosing the adventure, uh, Black Worm of Brandisford, awesome. Hideous Daylight? Uh, makes sense. Incandescent Grottoes, The Waking of Willoughby Hall, Through the Valley of the Manticore, and Vibrant Songs. All great adventures. <laughs> I like all of those, so I highly, highly appreciate that. How to adapt monsters from other OSR games. Like, this is just a very simple, beautiful system with a very interesting mechanic for leveling up and making your characters. I think it's beautiful. I, I really like simple systems like this. It, it's based on a... It's, it's not trying to do anything extraordinarily new, but, you know, it's not a new weird dice mechanic for solving your your tests or anything like that. It's just simple and straightforward, but I love that. And I think the whole thing works really, really well. So Shadow and Fae, second edition. Highly recommend you guys check this out. It'd be a really fun game to run really quick things, especially if you have that more fairy tale tone. You build into that idea of chapters. It's really cool, really cool idea. Finally, I'm gonna talk about Rogueland. This is a very short, very short RPG. Um, it's only 40 pages as well. 
but it's heavily influenced by Knave, Ars Magica, <laughs> and Net Hack, Wizardry, and Zork. Um, very, uh, very awesome. Very, very cool. Great use of public domain art throughout. But it's a very simple game. One of the things I love about this, though, is the random tables and the adventure uh, supplemental stuff that this game has. So there's a great hex map that it comes with. I love it. Really cool. Uh, how to build a character. You can use pre-packaged -pre characters or, or not. You can build your own. The different abilities and how those work. Characteristics, how to pack your bag, and your identity, which you get some traits. Um, very simple, straightforward packaged explore characters, right? So you start with stuff, uh, abilities, and uh, the title and all of that, right? Brute, champion, magician, medic, performer, wanderer. But you can pack your own bag, right? You can make your own character. Here's helmets, armors, and shields, weapons, exploration gear, general gear, identifying items. Some traits you can roll your character. So this is a bunch of great stats. I mean, this is sort of like comes right out of Knave or comes right out of uh, Maze Rats. It's obviously influenced by that heavily. And just, you know, in some cases, kind of just taken from it. But I really, really like how these are laid out. Very simple and straightforward. Advancing a character, how that works, how to gain levels, how they retire. A very simple character sheet, and you can see that this is very simple. Right? The whole game is right there. That's the whole character sheet. Very, very easy. Learning the game, how to play it, abilities, characteristics, how the bonuses work with uh, moderate modifiers plus your buff, how difficulty ratings work, 10, 13, 15, and 25. Those are the standard ones. And your ability saves, how those work as well. Inventory, encumbrance, etc. All the rules that you'll need to run the game. It's very simple. You can run it basically on two pages. How magic works. A little bit more complexity here. You have to add in magic, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, spell books, right? How to do different the, the attunements, how conjuring works. Um, really cool. And how to detect and cast magic. You got rogue magic, which is perform an action D12 on an object D12. So very simple. I transform armor, or I summon food, or I combine wind, or I teleport uh, animals. Whatever it is. I mend wood. And a D100 table for spells. Great, great spell table here. Masquerade. Leap. Comprehend. Hatred. Earthquake. Arcane Eye. Disassemble. Multi-arm. Spell seize. Upwell. Scry. Shroud. Web. Wizard Mark. X-ray vision. Sniff. <laughs> that reminds me of Duralius and Associates. The Bazaar. Standard items here that you're going to need. Armor, weapons, consumable items, lighting, and tools, adventure gear, and trinkets, food, clothing, animals for hire, everything you need there. How to roleplay encounters or basic advice about that NPCs. How to do combat. Very simple. Who goes first and the enemy morale. D6 for one, 2d6 for the other. Monsters. Very simple stat blocks for monsters. I love it. Very, very easy. I always love these sorts of things. Simple, straightforward easy to run. Traps and hazards, treasure, lots of cool treasure, magic items, some simple ones, simple uh, curses and blessings that you can use on them, and then adventure. Hex travel, how that works, how you're going to use it, environments, right, places to run into, uh, things to run into, and then open exploration encounters you can have here. Detailed exploration if you want to be more Careful, right, when you're going through dungeons or things like that. So this is the uh, dungeon turn, right, basically. How actions work, how the, how the sequence works. It's just, there's a set sequence. An unknown room, right? So if you're just wanting to randomly generate a dungeon, here you go. You've got some tables for that. And then locals, or locales and dungeons, excuse me. You've got Fortress of the Imp with a brief description. The Ethereal Mounds with a brief description. The Dead City, Castle Hexguard, Shipyard Shore, Herodon's Hold. The Stone Devotion. <laughs> I, I love it. Um, different uh, things you can run into here. The hallways, what's it like, the sewers, the tomb. Uh, Anagox. Anagox? Anagox? I don't know how to say that name, but statue, the sword, the shield, the scroll, it's tomb. Simple dungeon here. How to run it. Very, very easy. The Fungal Throne, you got another dungeon here. Great little dungeon map, dungeon location. With some references at the end. And have a character sheet at the back page. Rogueland is great. Highly recommend you guys check it out as well. I'll put links below to where you can all get it. But these are just simple systems. I love simple games. But rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, these things take what we have, put a you know, slightly different spin on it, take some new rules, repackage it, add in this home rule, change that home rule, and then present it, give it to us to check out and to see if it would work with our tables. I love that sort of thing. 
right? You can never have too many home-brewed mixed up systems because you never know when that particular combination of rules will fit your table's vibe. That's what I've found, right? That many times, most of the times, the set games that we get just don't fit. And so you have to homebrew, you change this, and then over time your table develops its own thing. Well, I love these little games because they do that for you. They're like, hey, here's what we've been doing. Or here's an idea that I had about about something to do at your table. Try it. And if you like it, awesome. Then you can incorporate it into your ongoing game. And if you don't, you can leave it aside. That's, you know, I think people often feel like we have to play a game. We have to play this one or play that one. But if you look at your game, right, if you actually look at what you're running, it's it's usually just a hodgepodge. It's a combination of different things. You're leaving out that rule. You're not playing that rule right. You're, you're, you're adding in this from that other game. So getting more, seeing more, it's always great to have, I think. Anyway, I hope you guys uh, think so too. And <laughs> I hope this has been an interesting video. We've gone through Rogueland, Shadow and Fey, Second Edition, and Stealing the Soul. I'll put links below to where you can get them all. All right, guys. See you all in another video.